Good morning. Um, let's do this quickly. I've got uh, something on my heart this morning that is relevant to, uh, number one, relevant to uh, what we've been studying in Revelation 10, and that is the mystery of God being finished. Um, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And um, the fact that I have 1 Corinthians 15 up on the screen um, is where we're going to be after that. And then Matthew 24, if you want to go ahead and turn to those places and <clears throat> put little bookmarks in there so we can get to them quickly. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of share with you um, where my heart is concerning... Um, the rapture of the church, uh, it's called by different names, rapture, the translation, the first resurrection, being caught up, all of those, all of those terms are valid, they all apply. Some will say, well, you don't find the word rapture in the Bible. Well, that is only partially true. Uh, the word rapture, the English word rapture comes from a Latin word. And that Latin word is what you'll find in a Latin Bible, and it means caught up. When you get enraptured, let's say you're listening to uh, a piece of music, and the music swells and builds, and uh, you get enraptured in that music, you get caught up in it. Uh, King, King George of England, he had commissioned George Frederick Handel to write an oratorio of uh, the Bible and of Jesus' life. And as the, the result of that was Handel's Messiah. When it came time for the Hallelujah Chorus, um, as King George sat there on the premiere of it, and he's listening to this, he is enraptured by the music, and, and so much so that he literally stands. And when everybody else, you know, when the king stands, everybody stands. So when he stood, everybody in the audience stood um, the whole time that the Hallelujah Chorus was being played. And somebody asked him afterward, why did you stand? And he said, just the, the majesty of that music uh, and, the, and the God uh, in whose name we praise uh, caused him literally to just be thrilled at not only the sound of the music, but the words of the music, which are taken right from scriptures. I've said this before, that in my opinion, the greatest joining together of, of scripture and music is Handel's Messiah. I, I don't think there's anything better than that, and there are some good hymns that have been written. Uh, but to me, that's the pinnacle of it. And so the, the Latin word that we get the word rapture from definitely applies there we will be caught up, not just emotionally either. It will be a physical and spiritual uh, enthrallment, in other words. So, uh, Revelation 10, the subject is in verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. Whenever the Lord appears in the air and says, Time's up! I'm going. Amen. I'm going. That there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. There is no questioning that the seventh angel referred to here is the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet that sounds. Uh, you'll see it over in, uh, we'll get to it when we get into Revelation uh, 11. Um, in verse 15, the seventh angel sounded. There was great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world. And that, that, this part of the verse is in Handel's Messiah. The kingdoms of this world 
um, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. I just thought I'd sing it. Hope you enjoyed that. Nobody stood. But anyway, it was enjoyable for me. Uh, he shall reign forever and ever. Um, so that's at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And this is, I, no doubt, there is no question, no doubt in my mind, that that's what's being referred to in verse 7. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. He's talking about sounding the trumpet. The mystery of God should be finished. And we've been looking at that mystery. So in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm kind of hurrying along through this because I have, a, I have a, an agenda. I have a point to make. And it does, it does in some way have to do with uh, the attempted assassination of a former president, uh, and I will say probably now a future president. I think he just won the election. Uh, I think, yeah, when you make a martyr of somebody, that's the dumbest move you can make, okay? Um, and I have Stephen mentioned in my message, so I won't mention much about him this morning, except to say they made Stephen a martyr. He's the first martyr of the church, and um, people just rally behind that. They just say, you know what? If that's how you're going to treat it, then game's on, okay? We're, we're going we're gonna to play. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. And so when the mystery of God is finished is when this mystery becomes known. It's going to be seen. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. There it is. And to me, there is no question that this is the seventh trumpet that has that is sounding that that's the one that Paul is referring to here in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written Death is swallowed up in victory. So all of, the, um, all of the things that you and I have endured in this life, all the things that we are yet to endure in this life, they're all going to pay off one of these days. We're go it's going to be worth whatever suffering that you've gone through in this life as a result of of your living for Jesus Christ, those things God will reward. He that endures to the end, uh, to him uh, will I give a, uh, I can't remember what Jesus said, a white robe, I think is what he said. But he's going to also give us a new name as well. So now, take your Bible and turn to Matthew 24. Even in the days when I would have said of what I'm going to say this morning, when I, when I would have disagreed with what I'm going to say this morning, I still had serious questions about Matthew 24. I was being told that what Jesus is saying here has no application to us, as Gentile believers whatsoever that none of this is appointed for us that it's all pertaining to Israel so uh, it's almost like you can skip reading this because it doesn't matter to you um, even so much so one um, I don't know what to call him. One preacher who I listened to, I, when I say recently, I'm going to say within the last 10 years. Um, I, have to, I have to give him some credit 
Uh, he's a very staunch defender of the King James, and he's written a book um, about the King James issue. It's about this thick, and uh, I used to have a copy. I don't know if I loaned it out to somebody or whatever, and God is paying me back for all the books that I borrow from people and never gave back. So I probably loaned it out to somebody and never got it back. But uh, what I read of it, I, I enjoyed. However... I listened to a sermon. I listened to like the first 10 minutes of the sermon. And I heard really all I needed to hear. He said that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are not intended for us. They have no doctrinal relevance to anything that we believe. And that we are not saved by the message of the four Gospels. I don't get it. They, they use this phrase, well, it was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. And I'm going, okay, that didn't clear anything up. And they say that all of this here is only for Israel. And here's the reason why. Here's the one big overarching reason why none of this can be applied to the Gentile church. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. It is, it is a staunchly held opinion that there is a seven year long period that the Bible calls the tribulation. Do what? The great tribulation. The great tribulation. Only no one can point to a verse in the scripture that says that. So, if you ask me, Mike, do you believe in the Trinity, the Godhead, that God and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, they are three, yet they are one? And I say yes, and you say, can you point to a scripture that says that? I go... 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, since these three are one. Well, do you believe that Jesus is equal to God the Father? Yes. Well, can you point to a scripture that says that? Yes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's one. I and the Father are one. That's two of them. There's several more. But if you ask me, Mike, where is the verse that describes the seven-year tribulation? My finger is still up in the air. It has no place to point to. None. Yes, Gary. Uh, I'm going to say this. I'm going to throw a hymn book at you. The only place that they, that they look at is the seven years of in Daniel. Or the 70 years. Hold up, hold up. I got to correct you right now. Doesn't say 70 years in Daniel. What does it say? Weeks. And who turned weeks into years? Who did? It's not there. Uh, here's what he's referring to. Daniel, uh, Daniel turn to Daniel 9. Daniel 9. And I know this like, this is probably just taking people like, where is he getting all this? This is, well, this is not what I heard. What I heard was, yeah, but can you point to a place in the scripture? Um, let's see here. Verse 24, Daniel 9. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And there's seven things here. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So seven things here mentioned in the seventy weeks. 
But there is, there is no mentioning whatsoever that the days of each one of these weeks equals a year, a day for a year. It's not here. In fact, in this, in this same chapter, chapter 9, Daniel is asking for some help here because he doesn't know how long they're going to be in Babylonian captivity. And he reads in Jeremiah that they're going to be there 70 years. And how does he come up with that number, 70 years? It's written in the text, 70 years. In other words, no secret code was applied to the 70 years that God said that they were going to be in Babylonian captivity. At the end of the 70 years, they're going to be brought back. There was no secret code. There was no exchange of a day for a year. It simply said 70 years, and it meant exactly 70 years. And Daniel said, okay, we're going to be here 70 years. So then, for some reason, the 70 weeks in verse 24 are taken and they're given a one year for a day, which would be 400, um, yeah, 490 years with a supposed seven year um, time frame unfulfilled. And I know what they do. They, they mark it from a certain point uh, in, in um, the history of, uh, of, of Israel and they count forward to supposedly um, the year that, um, that uh, Christ uh, came into the world and so on until Messiah comes. Let me ask you this question. In what year was Jesus born? Consider yourself on the same exalted level as the best archaeologists and the best Bible historians that there are, because nobody knows. Nobody knows what year he was. Do, do what? Feast of, Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. That happens every year, though. So here's here's my point. We don't know when Jesus was born, so we can't apply a historical timing of 490 years that rest and hinges upon the life of Christ. We can't do it because we don't know what year he was born. Um, anyway, aside from all of that, back to Matthew 24. No mention of tribulation being seven years long. No mention of it being three and a half years long. Um... You hear a lot about a peace treaty that's going to be made between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. I do not find a peace treaty in Scripture. Um, again, it goes back to Daniel 9. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But I don't necessarily think that that automatically shows that the Antichrist is going to make a peace treaty with Israel for one week. I, I, don't think it, I don't think it shows that. Anyway, let's look at Matthew 24 and let's, let's say that all of these things happen before the translation. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Good advice, Jesus. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I was troubled. Last night, um, by the attempted assassination of a presidential candidate, I would have been 
probably a vegetable on the floor sucking my thumb had that bullet been one inch to the left because it would have taken him out. Um, that's how close this nation came yesterday to the brink because you saw the reaction of Trump immediately afterward, fist raised to the sky, and the reaction of the crowd upon seeing that their favorite candidate uh, is standing up in the face of what was meant to be his demise and had they succeeded or whoever succeeded in putting that bullet through his brain, I think you would have had a riot on your hands. Um, and I think that that might have carried out literally all across the country. Um, I'm going to preach this morning on how the status quo loves to use assassination and death to shut down dissent. That's all in the Bible, by the way. That is a common theme. And I'll say it like this to us. We are the dissent in this world. We're the ones who say marriage is between a man and a woman. Period. We're the ones who say that abortion is a bloody, grotesque murder of an innocent child. And it should be outlawed all over the world, but if not, then all over this country. It should be outlawed everywhere. We are the dissent that says you're... Uh, you've got Texas and uh, New, uh, Louisiana and another state bringing the Bible back into the classroom. We're the people who say you should have never taken it out. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're the people who believe that right is right and wrong is wrong. And it doesn't matter if you're a poor man from the ghetto or you're someone... Uh, who has a silver spoon in their mouth and you've been uh, uh, You've never had to work a job your entire life you get elected to some high office Because of, of your last name or the money that your family has or whatever And it's the elite of this country who think they know better than the average man about what it is that we need and what it is that we want This is what trips my trigger I don't like, I don't mind people being rich. I just don't like rich people for the most part. Because they're very arrogant. They think that they know better. They think that they are better than the rest of us. And they're not. They're not. Um, I believe that this should be one nation under God. I, we are the, we're the people who believe that that we used to have laws on the books that governed morality in this country. I mean, do we not remember a day when they could not sell alcoholic beverages on Sunday? What happened to that? Did we not did we not in the state of Missouri have a ban on gambling? What happened to that? Did we not in this, in this state vote that marriage was between a man and a woman? Made it part of the Constitution, the laws, the state of Missouri. And we had that overthrown as well. I'm just saying that we are the dissenting voice for a lot of things in this country. And as such, you can expect then... For there be attempts to silence your voice. Can I hear you say amen? 
Um, verse 7 of Matthew 24. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines. Think about it now. People's going to be starving to death. It's going to be pestilences, diseases, um, an overrun of bugs, insects. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. They're going to be in different places everywhere. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Mark it down. We are going to go through a time of great sorrow. Great sorrow. Verse 9. I want you to pay attention to verse 9 now. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, what is it that we Christians uh, have, have sworn that we will try to do while we're here on this earth? We, we believe that we will attempt to spread the name of Jesus everywhere we go and to tell as many people as who listen to us that Jesus saves, that Jesus can forgive all manner of sins, that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And no man cometh to the Father but by Him. We're the ones who believe in salvation by grace, through faith, and that it's not of ourselves. Um, we're the ones who will try to convince all manner of sinner. And it doesn't matter to us what the sin is. Maybe their sin is fornication. Maybe their sin is sodomy. Maybe their sin is cursing. Maybe their sin is uh, drunkenness or uh, addictions. Maybe their sin uh, is hatred or whatever. We believe that we have the healing balm of God for all of those sins. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you is what we don't represent to this world is a physical army that plans on taking out all the sinners in this world and killing them all. We're not, we don't want to do that. That's not what Jesus... He didn't tell us to go into all the world and kill them. Kill them good. Jesus didn't say that. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe whatsoever things uh, I have showed you. And so we don't represent some great physical anarchist threat to the United States of America or even to our own communities. All we want to do is tell people that Jesus died for their sins. But Chris, that makes us dangerous. Dangerous. And why? I don't understand that. Why does that make us dangerous? Anybody want to give me their ideas? Because it's the truth, Gary? No, because, you know, people want, they, they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to Correct. hear the truth. Correct. Hmm? No. They don't, it's because they have an alternative gospel. One that benefits them. I mean, think of, think of the Catholic Church. Um, I can't remember if... I've told this story and I don't remember if I have permission to. There was an attempt to destroy our entire ministry in Kenya. It involved OT. They were going to set him up to be a murderer. 
and it didn't work. And the ones who were behind it, I won't say what religion they're from, but there were four men and they wear these little white things on their collar. Do what? Lutherans. We know it for a fact that they were behind that. That actually took place. And it's because of the things that I've been saying on the radio in those, in those areas against the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church does not like anybody else muscling in or moving in on their racket. They've got their areas and their territories and they want to expand it all they want to. And they don't like us preachers who preach against them and expose the truth of what they're trying to do. They don't like it. And so they have sought on more than one occasion to silence our ministry. And I know for a fact in Turkana and in some cases in Samburu. Okay? They've tried to stop what it is that God has us doing over there. I'm thankful uh, that if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? But that's, that's where it is. So when I, when I read this verse 9, They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Again, I, I've never said... I've never said in anything that I've said, because I know it goes out on the radio over there, I've never said to anybody, any of those people out in Kenya, uh, that they need to take up arms and rise up against uh, the evil uh, bishops, the evil uh, cardinals and evil archbishops of the nation of Kenya. They need to rise up and they need to uh, throw down their idols. They need to do this. They need... I've never said that. Don't believe it. Because I believe everybody has a right to a choice. But I believe everybody has a right to a choice. And if they're only given one choice, that is praying to idols of Mary, that's not giving them a true choice. I'm the other guy. And we're, or our church is the other group that wants to offer those people a true biblical choice. Show them the true gospel, reveal to them the mistakes of their false gospel, and let them choose this day whom they will serve. It's as simple as that. But that in itself makes us dangerous to their status quo over there, to their power that they have over those people. Verse 10, Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Let me move down, and, and um, we're running out of time here. Look at verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. All of these things are mentioned in the book of Revelation. They're mentioned in the book of Acts. They're mentioned in the book of Joel. They're mentioned in Isaiah. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 
And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. That's what I've been teaching on of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. There it is. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There right there is, I believe, your translation. The rapture being caught up. The first resurrection. We're going to be given new bodies on that day. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be meeting Jesus in the air. Because he's going to be appearing in the clouds. And from that point forward, we will always be with our Savior Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I think that that is a far, far better and more biblically based concept of the timing, um, the events surrounding the rapture, than the ideas that I used to believe in. Pre-trib, pre-millennial, pre-tribulational. Nothing happens. And then the rapture happens. And then all these, all of these things now happen according to them after the rapture. They don't happen before the rapture. And I just, I can no longer sign off on that. I can no longer agree to that. Does that make me a heretic? I, I don't think so. I think I'm just following the scriptures in the way that the scriptures has it laid out. Uh, but... Again, Paul said concerning this subject, wherefore comfort one another with these words. I'm not a debater. Um, I would not try to use these words against somebody to refer to them as a heretic. Um, because I know what it's like to leave behind um, deeply rooted convictions in your mind and in your heart. I know what it's like to walk away from those. It's not easy. Um, but I believe the word of God sets men free. Or makes men free. Father, we ask your blessings on your word today. Father, we ask your blessings, Lord, on the message preached this morning. Pray, Father, Lord, that it would bring light and honor and glory to your name. Father, that you would show us the things, Lord, that are coming. Help us, dear God, to be prepared for all things. Bless this morning's service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.